So what I want to do is give you a flavor of what's involved to try and point out how some of the things that we very much take for granted in, in modern programming languages actually originated with the, the EDSAC um, and show you some of the tools that are available if you want to play with writing programs for the, the EDSAC. Um, and there are a number of demonstration programs out there that you can, you can play with. So let's click on to the next slide. Um, first thing to do is, is why, why is EDSAC important? Why do the National Museum of Computing think it worth um, having a, an EDSAC replica in, in its premises? And why did the EDSAC group think it was an important thing to, to reconstruct? The, the key claim for EDSAC is that it was the world's first practical electronic digital stored program computer. Um, that mouthful means a computer as we understand it today. There are lots of claims about first computer, um, and I'm not really going to unpack that in detail. But the key things about a modern computer are that it is electronic, that it is digital in the way it works, that it, it can store programs and those programs can be changed. And there are a number of early machines that ticked those boxes. Indeed, the first working machine was probably the Manchester um, small scale experimental machine called Baby. But that was a laboratory experiment really built as a, a test harness to explore a a mechanism for designing a computer memory. EDSAC was built to allow people to write real programs to solve problems. Um, and that very much colors the, the design of the machine and the way the software system was put together. And so really the claim about EDSAC is less about it being one of the first computers, but more actually about it having the, the first computer programming system. Most of its contemporaries and, and earlier machines were essentially programmed in, in binary. So this is a picture of EDSAC as it looked um, shortly after it was built. The, the project started in 1947, the machine ran its first program on the 6th of May, 1949. Um, but at that point, it was still um, a little bit of an interim machine and a, a few subsequent changes were made. By, by 1950, 1951, it was running a regular computing service at the University of Cambridge for scientists, mathematicians, engineers, others who wanted to use the machine um, to perform calculations. And indeed, that's um, the driving purpose that the team who built EDSAC, um, led by Professor Maurice Wilkes, Dr. Wilkes as he was at, at that time, their aim was to very quickly build an experimental machine, get people using it to learn what people might do with a computer and what the actual requirements might be. Um, and so EDSAC was always seen as a stepping stone um, to, to what might come next, which is imaginatively called Ed, EDSAC too, but that's another story for another day. You'll see from the picture, um, EDSAC is from the Valve era. The technology is all based on um, wartime radar circuits. Wilkes worked on, on radar during the war, and most of his team came from, from that context. And that's the, the machine we're reconstructing um, to, today in the museum. And surprisingly, if you go out to surplus dealers, you can still get most of those valves there. They're still in the shops. So the, most of this lecture um, is actually really based on two texts. What one is the um, first book on programming um, called Weeks, Wilkes, Wheeler and Gill in the trade after its authors. Um, and this was the preparation of programs for electronic digital computer um, with special reference to the use of the EDSAC. It was written by three people from Cambridge, Wilkes who very much headed up the EDSAC project David Wheeler, who was um, one of Wilkes's research students and did most of the work on the, the software and the programming system. And Stanley Gill, for whom I haven't got a photograph, unfortunately, um, was a colleague of theirs who ran the operational side of the machine. And that book was published in, in 1951. Um, and if you can find a copy in a second-hand bookstore, it's certainly worth getting hold of. Um, 
which summarizes very much the, the Cambridge attitude to the computer they, they built. Um, that it wasn't for them an exercise in building the biggest or the fastest or necessarily the cleverest machine, but about understanding how it could be used and, and, and make it useful. And there are some things which many of us have learned in our own computing careers summarized in, in these sentences. So it says to the potential user of an automatic digital calculating machine, the successful design and construction of the machine itself is only a first step, though certainly an essential one. In order that the machine should in practice be useful to him in the calculations he may desire to carry out with its aid, the provision of an adequate organization for using the machine is as important as the machine itself. Those of us who use machines in the 60s and 70s probably wish some of the manufacturers had read that, that sentence and thought about it. So it goes on to say the process of building up such a library of subroutines and testing its value by practical use appears to have proceeded further at the mathematical laboratory of the University of Cambridge than elsewhere. The mathematical laboratory was the department in the university where EDSAC was built. In more recent times, it's called itself the computer laboratory, and it has an even newer name these days. I think it's called the Department of Technology or something like that. And then concludes with the subject is one which is still developing. Nothing much changes. Um, as someone who spent a substantial part of his career in, in Microsoft, certainly that third paragraph um, about um, not um, having programming be a, a, a black art um, and making it um, something that can be undertaken by mere mortals was, was very much um, part of Bill Gates' driving vision, what he wants to achieve with Microsoft. We'll leave it to another talk as have a discussion about whether he achieved that or not. And certainly um, research in programming continues to this day. So let me, first of all, um, as any programming lecture would do, um, introduce you to the machine and talk about its basic principles of operation. EDSAC is very simple, as revealed by the block diagram. There is a, a store, we call that memory today. Um, there is control, we'd probably call that the arithmetic and logic unit today, although um, in Wilkes's picture, he broke out the arithmetic unit as something separate. And that kind of reflects the physical construction of the machine. You may remember from the photograph, there were three rows of racks. The middle row is control. The back row is arithmetic unit. And the front row is essentially clock and input and output. The arithmetic unit has a, a single register called the accumulator, which you can think of as being like the window on a, on a desk calculator, electric desk calculator. And output was to um, a teleprinter, later to punch paper tape. Input came from paper tape, um, and the, the control system would fetch instructions from the store, drive the arithmetic unit to carry out calculations, reading in data as required, and outputting it. So let's talk about the store. Um, the store was built using ultrasonic delay lines. These were um, tubes of mercury called tanks. At the um, end of the life of the machine, um, it, the, there are 64 tanks that could hold a, 1,024 words of 70 bits, um, stored in two's complement for those who uh, know about machine representations and the most significant digit corresponded to the, the sign of a number. So a positive number always begins with a zero and a negative number always begins with a one in binary. For most of the life of the machine, actually um, people only use 512 locations and that the store was um, one of the several Achilles heels that EDSAC had. Um, and so quite often um, bits of the store were, were out of commission. So people tried to keep their programs fairly small and. Uh, this modern day and age telling someone that they've got to fit their program in their data in one key words is, is laughable. The store um, was, as you might expect, um, addressed um, using integers 0 to 1023. Um, and I've copied most of these phrases out of Wilkes, Wheeler and Gill, where they're explaining a computer to people who've never seen one before. And so the, the reference number for each location in store is called its address. The 17-bit um, numbers are called short numbers. Um, 
That's because there was um, the opportunity, if you wanted to have more precision in your calculations, to store a long number um, comprising 35 bits in two consecutive locations, provided they were aligned with even addresses. And that gave you a 35-bit long number. Um, if there's time at the very end, someone's allowed to ask me, why is it that the short numbers are 17 bits? You might think a long number would be two short numbers, but that would be 34 bits. We, we've gained a bit somewhere. Um, it's an artifact of the way the hardware works. The arithmetic unit um, has essentially um, an adder, a complementer, a collating unit, and a shift function. And those could be combined to provide subtraction, multiplication, and rounding. Um, there was no divide instruction in EDSAC. If you want to do division, you did it by a numerical calculation. The accumulator, reg the accumulator register had 71 bits. Um, that's so you could multiply two 35-bit long numbers and hold the whole result. There was a register called the multiplier register. We'll see how that is used when we start to come to some of the examples. The input was on five hole paper tape. Um, that was the kind of paper tape that was used by um, the kind of teleprinters that the, the post office used for sending telegrams and so forth, backwards and forwards. Although as we discover, the EDSAC team invented their own code. Um, to make life slightly convenient for themselves. And the output went to a teleprinter, um, which also was driven by a five hole code, although a somewhat different one. Um, and the, the teleprinter was essentially a standard um, general post office creed um, teleprinter that had been chopped about by the EDSAC engineers. The control function is very simple. Um, it fetches the next instruction, they call them an order, um, from the store into the control unit, that's called stage one. Um, it's that order is then decoded, which they call stage two, and stage two essentially invites the arithmetic unit to carry out whatever mathematical function is required. And then having had the signal back for the arithmetic unit that that um, particular function has been complete, the machine then generally automatically fetches the next order from the location following the one just executed. And we'll see in a few slides time how you can jump to break out of that normal sequence. Interestingly, um, I appeared in Cambridge as a research student in 1975 and worked on a machine that was being built in the lab at that time called the, the, the capability machine cap and that was microprogrammed and in the microprogram sequence there was a part called stage one and a part called stage two so that vocabulary persisted through the, the design of cambridge machines well into the, the 1970s so that's the hardware of the machine the key things to remember are 17-bit short numbers 35-bit long numbers and a store um, of essentially 1,017 bit words or 512 um, long words, input and output from paper tape. So um, to introduce you to the um, order code, um, I don't expect you to memorize this. As we look at some examples, I'll explain it again. Um, it's very simple. There aren't that many instructions. Um, an order was written as a letter for the function to be carried out, an address which specified the location in the store, which was to be used as an operand, and then either an F or a D to indicate whether a short or a long number should be used. Um, why F and D? I'll talk about that when I describe the, the initial order system for loading programs into the machine. And the, um, the instruction um, letters were quite mnemonic in several cases. So A, N added the contents of location N to the accumulator. If it was followed by an F, it would add a short number to the accumulator. If it was followed by a D, it would add a long number. S subtracted the contents of the memory location from the accumulator. 
Now we come to the orders that deal with multiply. To do a multiply, you first um, load a number into the multiply register using the H order. And then you can use the V or the N order. And you notice it's a bit like um, a desk calculator in the multiply can um, add or subtract from the running total. So if you use the V order, the, the contents of the um, instruction addressed by the, the V order would be multiplied by the multiplier and the product added to the accumulator. And so you could build up a running total of, of products. Or if you use the N order, um, the, um, the, the product was subtracted from the accumulator. And so you could, you could count down as well as up. The um, T order is essentially how you stored things back in the memory. It transferred the contents of the accumulator to the location in store and then cleared the accumulator in the, the same instruction. Sometimes you might want to store an intermediate result, but carry on working with it. And for that, you had the U order, which just did the transfer, but didn't do the clear. Collate um, as logical collation. You can think of it as logical and. This collated the contents of a store location with a multiplier and added it to the, the accumulator. Um, the, um, the, the fact that it's um, a collate with the multiplier and adding to the accumulator is a hint that there's some logic shared between the, the collate function and the multiplier function in the internal organization of the electronics. There was a um, shift instruction. The simple cases are to shift by one place. Um, if you wrote R, that moved the accumulator one place to the right. That was essentially equivalent to dividing by two. If you use the L instruction, it would shift it one place to the left, which is like multiplying by two. If you put an address field um, in the R and L orders, it got a little bit more complicated. Um, what actually is going on is um, effectively the hardware looks for the first bit that is set um, in the F and the address fields and takes that bit as the number of places to shift. So when you're writing shifts, you have to be quite thoughtful. You don't, if you want to shift two places, you don't write 2LF, you just write LF. Um, if you want to shift four places, you would write, um, you would write L2F and so it comes through. Um, so the, 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 the shift orders, um, were a bit tricky to use. Um, had to be careful in remembering that they, they had a different kind of way of using the address. Then there are the two conditional orders, um, only two, and that's another weakness of the machine. There was no um, test for equals to zero, and that can be a nuisance at times. The E order tests if the accumulator is positive. If it is, you continue, um, Sorry, if, if, the, if the accumulator is positive, you jump to location N, otherwise you continue. And the G order tests if the accumulator is negative. And if it is, you go to location N, otherwise you continue serially. So you can count um, down, um, checking a number is negative, and then when it goes positive, you can, you can branch out the loop and so forth. Um, said it's annoying if you want to test for zero precisely, you essentially um, have to um, convince yourself that the number is, um, is positive and subtract one from it and watch it go negative. And then you know it must have been zero because you've, you've calculated minus one. That, that's quite messy. Input and output, um, the I order reads the next five bit code from the input paper tape reader um, to location N. So it reads direct into store. The output function is um, the letter O. In simple terms, you can think of that as outputting to the teleprinter. Um, it doesn't quite work that way. The, um, the character is set up as the next thing to be output. And the previous character that had been set up goes to the teleprinter itself. Um, 
The, the reason for that is there was also an F order like, that would read back what's been set up on the teleprinter. So you could check that um, the output order has indeed transmitted the right code to the teleprinter and it's going to print the correct character for you. Um, that was abandoned later in the life of the machine, which is why the X order was called ineffective um, by the, the um, EDSAC team. What they mean in, in modern terms is a no-op. Um, it's a useful instruction because it's a way in which you can pad out programs with a bit of a gap in which you can insert extra orders if you want to change your, your program um, without having to rewrite big, big parts of it. There's a Y order that does rounding um, and the magnificent Z instruction, which halts the machine and rings the bell to tell you your program's completed. And remember, EDSAC was quite a slow machine. It ran at about 650 instructions a second. And so you had to be quite patient. And I'm sure many users and operators will sit and read the newspaper and rely quite heavily on the bell to uh, tell them to uh, do, the next, do the next thing. Final bit of architectural um, detail to um, understand, and again, a, a difference from what we're used to with, with modern machines. The arithmetic in EDSAC is fixed point. There is no floating point. And the number in the accumulator and the multiply register, et cetera, are assumed to be binary fractions, i.e. Um, the top digit is effectively the sign. Then there's a binary point. And so the next digit represents one half and the next digit after that represents one quarter. So as far as the computer's concerned, um, your bit patterns represent numbers um, between minus one and just under, under one. If you um, have numbers that are outside that range, if you understand two's complement arithmetic, you can predict what will be computed, but generally that's not, not a path you want to go down. When you multiply two long numbers together, the resulting digits are all there in the accumulator, so you're not losing any precision. Um, but obviously, if you want to store the result, you would probably round it and then do a, a long store. So let's have a look at a first very trivial um, EDSAC program. Suppose we wanted to compute x plus y plus x times y. And it so happens that X is in location five and Y is in location six. Um, this is how the, the program would look. Um, assuming we start with an empty accumulator, we would add location five as a um, short number. I'm assuming short numbers throughout. That adds X into the accumulator. We add location six, which is Y, into the accumulator. Um, that's got X plus Y in the accumulator. We can then load X, which is location five, into the multiplier register. We multiply that by location six, um, and the multiply does the multiplication and adds it into the accumulator. And so we should see the result. Well, let's have a look. Let's come into the system that I use for testing EDSAC. Hopefully you can now see um, a terminal window. So I'll run a little demo called demo one. I'll talk you through what's going on here. The, this, this is the system I use for writing um, test programs for EDSAC. There's a little assembler um, that reads in the, the program in source code. It generates the binary that is to be loaded into the store. And there's a little decode at the side. So you can see this is our program, A5F, A6F, um, as we walked through. And then the, the two um, numbers at the end, because this um, reverse compilation doesn't know their numbers, it's showing them as instructions. And then I run that through a little simulator with some options to say, I want to trace the instruction execution. I'm loading the binary from the file I put it in, and I want to start EDSAC with that binary in the store. So we, we see um, the A instruction that loads a half into the accumulator. We see the second instruction that adds a quarter. That's in the accumulator. Um, this tracing mechanism essentially shows you each instruction as it's executed. And whenever the accumulator changes, it shows you the revised value. We do H that updates the multiplier, doesn't change the accumulator. 
we do the multiply and there we have our results um, in the accumulator and the machine halts with a, a Z instruction. So that's um, showing the, the, the process at work. And remember these are fixed point fractions. So that's a half, that's a half plus a quarter. That's a half plus a quarter plus an eight, which is the, the answer we would expect. Back to the PowerPoint. You can do integer arithmetic. Um, essentially, um, if you put um, integers in, in the store locations and in the accumulator for addition, subtraction, et cetera, um, it works as you expect. But when you come to use the multiplication, the multiplier is always treated as a, as a, as a fraction. So if we were to do this same calculation, but this time with um, X and Y as integers. So here I've encoded them as, as plus 10, that's plus 10 in binary, and plus five, that's plus five in, in binary. I have to somewhat rework my program. Um, I, I need to pick up the 10 from, and it'll be address eight, multi, um, multiply um, by the five from address nine, then, um, because they're being treated as fractions, I need to multiply by two to the 16 to push the fraction um, up the accumulator back into the right place to be an integer. Because of the way the, um, the shift order works, I can't actually do a 16 way shift. So I have to write two shift orders to do that to achieve the effect. And then I add in, um, and we add in location nine to add back in the 10 and the 15. And if we come back to the um, script, if I now run um, demo two, you'll see in the demo it's seven and eight, there are the shifts. Um, and we see, <coughs> um, the, the H and the V to do the multiplication. Our multiplication of five by 10, which is 50, ends up down in the um, bottom half of the accumulator because it's being treated and those, those things as fractions. And so the number gets smaller. I do the first shift and the second shift, that brings the number back up into the um, top um, part of the accumulator as an integer. And then I can add um, my 10 um, and I can add my five and I end up with the correct answer of 65, which I, I was expecting in the first place. So um, really the, the key thing to take away from that is if you are working integers and you want to multiply, you've got to remember that the multiplication um, multi includes a multiplication by two to the minus 16 that you have to eventually undo. How do we write loops in EDSAC? Um, well, we use the um, jump instructions to do that. So let's have a simple program that wants to print the digit seven on the teleprinter um, five times. Now I have to be a little bit careful. We'll say more about the character code in a few minutes, but the, the teleprinter essentially had a figure shift in which it would type out numbers mostly and a letter shift in which the codes would be interpreted as alphabetic letters. So as we're printing out numbers, the first thing we do is we output um, the code for figure shift. Um, figure shift is actually in location 10. Um, and so that's the, the code. Remember in the, in the output instruction, the code is read from the top five bits of the, the word in store. I then set a count to minus five. Um, I do that by um, subtracting location eight, which is five from the accumulator, which is zero. That gives me minus five. Each time round, I increment the account by adding one. I output a number seven. The output instruction doesn't disrupt the accumulator. Remember it goes straight from the store. If the account is still um, negative, then I go back round again. So I'll count down, um, count should be set, uh, that should say five, hey ho. The count comes down, um, I type out the, the seven, yeah, print the seven five times. So it types out the seven, um, the count comes down five, four, three, two, one, and when it gets to zero, um, the G can't move back. 
So we output um, a line feed um, and um, a figure shift to force the line feed out, and then we halt. So again, we can look at a quick demo of that. And that's going to be demo three. And you can see there is, there is the program as before. Um, you can see there are the five sevens that were output by to the teleprinter. And you can see inside the program here, essentially the count coming down. And when it goes to zero, the, <clears throat> the program stops. The, the tracing that's provided um, in this EDSAC command, um, the basic model is it actually follows one of the tracing utilities that EDSAC program has used that prints out the first letter of each order as it's executed um, and starts a new line, either when it wants to print out a change in the value of the accumulator or when a jump is taken. So you'll see after these Gs, because we're still in the loop and we're going round, there is a new line, we've gone back to the beginning, but this G, when the accumulator is zero, there is no jump. So we just do those two final outputs to get the, um, the text on the screen, and then we halt. And that forgetting that um, need to output something extra to get the last character out is an easy thing to um, forget when you're writing EDSAT programs. It's quite frustrating. So far, so good. Um, where EDSAC is um, rather frustratingly weak as um, compared to a modern machine is if you're trying to index, for example, if you're trying to march along a vector of numbers. So here in this program at the end, we've got these um, five numbers, one, two, three, four, five. Imagine we wanted to write a loop um, that added up those numbers running itself round as a loop. So how do I, I do that? There is no index register in EDSAC. Um, the, the idea of an index register was invented by Manchester University in the Manchester Mark I, and they invented it slightly too late for it to be included in um, EDSAC initially, although the idea was adopted a little bit later by EDSAC. In, in Manchester, the index register was called a B line um, because the accumulator was called an A line. And indeed, in um, the later EDSAC, it was called the B register. And if you come to my talk about programming Elliott machines um, at the end of February, you'll find out that Elliott's copied the name and, and called them B registers as well. So if we want to do an index calculation by like adding up that little vector, we have to write self-modifying code that manipulates the, the program in store. And we end up doing arithmetic on instructions and cells, which is um, a little untidy. So we do actually have to understand the way orders are laid out in binary. Um, and the way that's, that's done is the first, most five most significant bits in an order are the order code. And it is the code in the input um, paper tape reader code. There's one bit which is spare, um, which in later life um, told you to use the B register and add it to the, um, the absolute address. There are 10 bits to hold the, um, the address field of the instruction. Um, so the 13 in instruction zero of this program. And then the least significant bit is a zero if you want to man manipulate the data as a short number or a one if you want to manipulate it as a long number. So um, looking at this program, um, step zero, um, clear the accumulator, um, <clears throat> put the, the total away, add in um, location, um, pick up the sum, which is zero. We then add location 15, which is the first entry in the table. We store that in the sum, um, and then we start to cheat. Um, We've, we've done a T, so the accumulator is clear. We pick up location two, which was that add 15F instruction. We then modify it by adding um, location 12, which if we're adding two, we're adding one to the address field. 
So we're turning A15F into A16F, and then we drop it back in location two. Um, so essentially we're incrementing the address field of this instruction. And then we do the um, usual kind of things um, to um, check if we're at the end of the loop. And at the very end of the loop, we load the sum into the accumulator and halt the machine. So effectively, what we're looking for in this test here is to see um, when that instruction has been modified and becomes A20F, since location 20 is after the table, that's the instruction we stop on. So we keep um, incrementing this order from 15 to 16 to 17 to 18 to 19. And when it gets to 20, we, we bomb out of the program. And so if we look at a demo of this, this must be demo four. That's what I want to say about that. Don't want to say a great deal, I'm not going to walk you through it step by step. Um, You'll see the, um, the, the program has been loaded and the typical um, sequence going round, coming out at the end with a, a, a G that's detected a zero. And you'll see that at the end of the program, the accumulator contains 15 in its total. Um, and so that should give you confidence that the program did what you expected. Now, um, that kind of way of programming is. Um, much frowned upon in this modern day and age. Um, Self-modifying code is, is held to be evil. Um, the, the real frustration is if you're doing something like multiplying two vectors or trying to um, look after manipulating a stack or any other kind of data structure that you might implement using arrays in a modern programming language, you just end up with lots of this kind of thing going on. Um, and it could be very hard to, to keep track of it. Um, and it really is, is quite a nuisance. It makes programming painful. Um, one really wishes that um, Cambridge hadn't waited for Manchester to invent the B register, um, but had got there them, themselves. Um, but I think when they were designing the machine, they hadn't realized um, that there would sometimes be a requirement to do things like operate on vectors. They thought everything would be the kind of linear calculations that we saw earlier, like x plus y um, plus x times y uh, and so forth. So I've kind of taken you through the, the basics of the instruction set and how you think about programming um, EDSAC. You've seen me um, using an emulator. Um, the one I've been using so far is what we've been using for um, generating and checking test programs for, for the EDSAC replica. Obviously, the, the, the challenge of writing test programs is how do you know the test program works um, when you're using it to test a machine which you know doesn't work. Um, so what we have um, is a simple assembler, um, which has been written with fairly modern facilities to make it easy to write short programs. And then, um, an emulator you can drive from the command line, which you saw, and that's that adapted from an original written by um, Lee Wittenberg, um, mm -hmm. who's who's on the call, I think, and I, I stole it from um, the CCF Computer Conservation Society website, um, and it's it's really quite useful. Made some modifications um, to give me the tracing that I needed and the ability to load the the binary patterns. So on EDSAC itself, um, we put the programs into memory using a magic box called a signal sequence injector. Um, and that squirts the program into main store from location zero. And then we hit the start button um, and, and the program runs. But that's not how it's done the real EDSAC. So we're, we're getting to EDSAC user programming um, next and show you those facilities. Um, if you want to play with my assembler and with the emulator, they're both out there on um, GitHub and uh, you're welcome to use them and play with them. So how do real EDSAC programmers um, write their code? Well, they started by writing their program out on an EDSAC program sheet. You'll notice a certain amount of ambiguity in early EDSAC documents as to whether program has an ME or not. Um, 
Wilkes was very insistent we should use the American term um, program, and he always did. Others took a little while to be converted. Um, so you would write your program out on a coding sheet um, and think about the, the logic and on the coding sheet, obviously you could write comments and so forth. And then um, the program would be punched using a machine called a, a perforator, basically a kind of typewriter, but a typewriter that produced paper tape to produce the, the five hole paper tape. And indeed, if you're a, um, a, a, a competent EDSAC programmer, you could hold one of these tapes up to the light and, and read that, that um, program off and check it back against your, your list. Let's say something about the, um, the paper tape codes. Um, so that there were two, there was the perforator code, um, which um, was used for input. Um, you'll notice in the table, it says letter shift and figure shift, but there isn't actually a letter shift and figure shift character. Um, so if you typed the binary pattern 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, that could be a Q or a 1. Um, either, either those characters would produce that pattern on the tape. And we'll, we'll talk a bit more about how that was dealt with um, in, in a few moments time. Um, on the output side of things to the teleprinter, there were codes to shift between figure shift and letter shift, and there was a much more extensive um, output, uh, the alphabet, so that you could output a wider range of, of symbols. Um, now, if we're um, writing EDSAC programs in this modern day and age, it's not always convenient to be able to type symbols like pi and theta and phi and delta. Um, and um, I'll both the emulator I was using just now and one I'll show you next, they provide the facility for you to use modern ASCII symbols in, in their place. And that's what most people do when writing EDSAC programs today. Um, notice, as I said, the, the order field in an instruction is the bit pattern of the order character. So the, um, the A order has the, where's A gone? Has the pattern 111000 or 28. Um, and so notice the convention for how you can type the Greek characters when you're using the emulators. So the way in which a user program was loaded into EDSAC from paper tape was via something called initial orders. And this was a fixed program um, that was wired on this contraption. This is a batch of X post office telephone exchange uniselectors. And the wiring on these was essentially the bits of that initial orders program. When you press the start button on the machine, the instructions on the uniselectors are copied into the store of the machine and execution begins at, at the first location, location zero of those orders. And those orders contain essentially an assembler and a linker um, that reads in your code written in alphanumeric form. And that was a unique aspect of EDSAC, that you're, you didn't have to understand binary um, to write your program. And um, the initial orders are amazing. There's only about 47, 48 instructions in the initial orders um, to do all the work that we'll be exploring in the next few slides. Um, if you think you understand EDSAC and the instruction set, then I recommend um, looking up this reference um, Wheeler wrote a paper um, in 1950 about um, the initial orders and the library concept um, that he invented. Um, and you can download that today and, and read it. I certainly find if I try and read the initial orders program, I can call it, sort of understand it while I'm reading it. Um, but if I go downstairs and have a cup of tea and come back, I have to start learning it all over again. It's, it's full of every evil trick you can think of in terms of self-modifying code referencing some of its own instructions um, as, as data and, and constants and so forth. Um, but the key thing is that you could write your programs in symbolic form, they were alphanumeric, and it allowed a user program to be linked to predefined library routines that would do things like reading numbers for you, printing numbers, and performing mathematical calculations. And it was the existence of that extensive library um, that made EDSAC easy to use. 
And indeed, if you read Wilkes, Wheeler and Gill, um, yeah, Wilkes, Wheeler and Gill, then um, over half the book is essentially a description of the, the library um, and, and the functions provided. So um, key things to understand about the initial orders, the instructions are in alphanumeric form rather than binary. In addition to writing orders, um, you could write things called control codes and that told the initial orders um, mechanism where to load your program and how to fix up addresses when it was joining subroutines to user code and, and where to enter the user code to run your program. That meant you could essentially um, load your program and follow your program tape with all the subroutines you needed um, in any arbitrary order of those routines and the initial orders will sort it out for you and tie everything together properly. Um, and I'll show you some examples of um, how there were some quite clever addressing techniques to get you away from using the absolute addresses that I was using in the, the simple examples I showed you earlier. Um, but one big warning, there is no error handling initial orders. Um, it doesn't complain if you feed it garbage. Um, it just plows on and does whatever it thinks um, you, you were trying to tell it to do, um, even if it's not something that's, um, as it were, correctly specified. So um, here's um, an example of a very simple program, um, if you like, a, a Hello World program, in the way that an EDSAC user would have written it and punched on their paper tape. Um, so at the start, we have something here, which um, is not instruction sequence. This T64K um, GK is um, a control combination. It says to start loading the program at location 64. And GK says set a parameter called theta to the, the current address. And the first thing this, this program does is stop. But if we then push the start button again, it runs. Um, the program is um, now we're using essentially relative addresses to the start of the program. So we're not writing 64, 65 here. So um, the first instruction is to output something at five locations relative to theta. So one, two, three, four. That, that's right, our theta is there. One, two, three, four, five. That's star F. Um, that's the representation in instruction form of letter shift. Um, star is how we write the arrays character in the input to the, the various emulators. And then there's the H and the I written as um, in instruction format. And then at the very end is another control sequence EZPF, um, and that says enter your program at location theta, um, which will be 64 because that's where you loaded it. Don't in any way think of these control combinations as being, um, what's the word I want, um, mnemonic. Um, they are magic things you just have to memorize um, and use, um, and you just get used to the, the, the patterns of them. So that's how you'd write your program on your, your coding sheet. And notice you have to keep track of um, the locations of the instructions and where your, your data is. And if you suddenly decided you wanted to add an instruction to the program, um, if you wanted to print out something else after high, then a new instruction going in here, all these things move down. And so you have to go back and fix up the addresses in your program. And that's one of the frustrations of, of EDSAC programming. There are no labels um, in the way you think of them <coughs> in a modern assembly language. This is then what gets punched on the paper tape um, as, the, as the, the characters. Um, there are no, no comments on the paper tape. It's just linear characters. So let's see that working in practice. If I now come and switch to um, this window. This is an EDSAC simulator uh, written originally by Martin Campbell Kelly when at the University of Warwick. Um, and it gives you a very nice GUI interface um, and um, captures very much the way an EDSAC itself works. Um, 
on the original EDSAC. There were cathode ray tubes where you could look at the contents of the, the memory. Um, this window represents the, the teleprinter. It also um, represents um, some of the internal registers of the machine. And again, you could look at those on, on cathode ray tubes and help you debug your program. And these were the buttons that the operators had available to them. So the first thing the operator would typically do is, is clear the memory, then load a paper tape um, into the paper tape reader. This is that program we saw previously. Anything in red like this is ignored by the emulator. Um, it's essentially treated as comment. It just reads the stuff in black. So if I press start, the tape reader starts. The memory of the machine fills up with the um, program. Um, I think the program fits in um, two tanks. Um, so I was looking at tank one and tank zero. And then if I hit start, the, the program will run. Should have hit reset, not start, I beg your pardon. And there's the output from the, the program. So um, we'll come back and look at this emulator in more detail as we explore uh, more aspects of, of programming the machine. So that was a very simple program. Key things to take note of are control combinations to say where you want the program put. The fact that in your program, you don't have to know the absolute addresses of the instructions in your program and your data, but you do have to know the relative addresses um, and that that can be a little bit tedious. This is the teleprinter with its output coming out here. This is the paper tape reader. Um, this is three of the cathode ray tubes. This is a picture of one of the storage tanks. Here's an example of um, output. Um, because it was to a teleprinter and the teleprinter was slow, you're encouraged to make your output as short as possible. Um, and so there wasn't very much pretty printing or, or headings or whatever. Typically people just produce numbers. And later in the life of the machine, the teleprinter was replaced with a paper tape punch. So the output could appear faster and then you would print it offline. So the simulator I'm using is the, the Warwick simulator. You can download that if you go to edsac.net. Um, it says they're available for Windows and Mac OS. It's not quite um, available for Mac OS yet, but there is um, a Linux version on here um, that you can download as well. So it's available for, for most of the um, modern popular operating systems. It's very comprehensive. It includes a tutorial guide, which is where I've stolen the, the examples um, from that I'm using for this part of the talk. It has um, copies of a big part of the original EDSAC subroutine library and lots of worked example programs. So quick whiz through the, the control combinations. I don't expect you to memorize these, but just to give you an idea of what could be done. TMK sets the, the load point for the next instruction to be the address M. GK sets the theta parameter to the load point so you can address relative to the current piece of code you're loading. TZ sets theta back to whatever it was before you did the GK. Um, so you can load something and then go back to the addressing you were using before. This sequence says enter the program at location M. This sequence says enter the program at location theta um, and PZ or PK. Typically those would be at the start of a new um, block of paper tape essentially to get the initial orders in the state where they were recognizing control combinations. There are many more than these, but these are the ones that um, get, get most heavily used. So the next question is how to do subroutines in Xset. If you're going to use a subroutine library, there wasn't a subroutine jump instruction um, in the order code. So the way it's done um, was a technique invented by David Wheeler, and it was named after him as the Wheeler jump. The way you go to a subroutine is you, assuming the, the accumulator is empty, you pick up this instruction by writing AMF, whatever location M is. And so it loads the bit pattern of this order with the correct address in it. Then you jump to the subroutine, which is assumed here to be starting at location N. And inside the subroutine, you add the contents of location three, 
to this thing's own address and you store it as the last instruction of the subroutine. It turns out in the initial orders, location three contains a UTF. And basically, if you add a U2F to an AMF, that turns into an E to that instruction. So you jump to location M plus two, and the plus two is coming from the, the two there. Um, a plus U equals E, if you look at the, um, the, the, um, the, the paginator code, the, the perforator code. And so it calculates E M plus two and puts it at the end and returns to the caller. So this works fine, um, provided you don't try and do anything clever like recursion. Um, and recursion hadn't really been invented in, in programming in 1940, 49, 1950. Um, and the link is inside the routine. So subroutines can call subroutines and it all sorts itself out quite nicely. So that's quite a, a neat trick for getting into subroutines. Um, so let's show an example. Um, this is an example that uses a library subroutine called P6 to print integers. It's going to print a table of cubes using a, a fairly well-known formula. We don't have to get lost in, in the mathematics. We'll just show how we put the, the program together. So um, this is the program. I'm not really going to go through a great deal of detail. It starts with the usual sequence to allow me to have relative addresses inside the, the program itself. Um, it does the output. Um, it then has a loop that's going around counting, executing that recurrence relationship I showed you on the previous slide. And towards the end of the program, are the constants and variables that you need. And notice there's no way in the initial orders notation of inputting those actually as numbers or letters. You have to write them in the, um, the order code equivalent. It's not too difficult for things you want to output because it goes in the order code field. And for writing simple constants, um, P is the order code that corresponds to zero. The address is zero. I remember um, D was one if you wanted to uh, work on a long number. So P0D calculates one. P1F, F is a zero. That's a one in the uh, lower bit of the address. And so that essentially gives you uh, the number two. So it's not too difficult to work out small constants. Um, and in the tutorial guide, there's a handy table of most of the useful um, constants you need. So the way you make up um, the, the program is um, you would typically start um, with a control combination. Um, 56 was really the first useful location in which you could load a program. So you say start loading at location 56. You read in the library routine P6. Um, this actually is the code for P6 up, up here. Just read in that tape then copy after that um, a PZ to say you're starting the next block. Then you copy in your program, um, which was all, the user's program was always called the master routine. You copy in the user's program and you finish that with an EZPF, which says jump into the start of that program. So this is a complete um, program tape. And if we look at running this on the emulator, come back again. So that one was reciprocals. If I select reciprocals, I clear the store of the machine. I start the machine reading in the paper tape and the reciprocals program runs. And it prints out a table of reciprocals. Notice the print routine doesn't do any rounding. Um, now I can ask the simulator to run at real time and you'll see things are a little bit slower than um, those quick demonstrations. Takes a little while to fill up the store. And then typing on the um, teleprinter was really quite slow. You could definitely, as it were, hear EDSAC computing um, and eventually um, the numbers start coming out. So it wasn't a very fast machine by modern standards, but what you have to remember um, is it was about 1,500 times faster than a postdoc with a Brunsviga hand calculator doing the same thing.
So let me come back to the presentation. So the idea of writing your programs is you write your master routine and then you um, link um, in the, the subroutines that you want to call. Um, and um, there is the, the, the call to, um, since you've loaded P6 at location 56, there is the call to the subroutine. So if you, if you feed the subroutine and put it in a fixed location, um, then you, you know where it is. Your, your program's using relative addresses. It just follows on. That's nice and simple. So notice the, the conventional coding sheet style for, write, for drafting your programs. There's no layout on the EDSAC tape. There are no comments um, on the original EDSAC tape, although the emulator allows them. Um, the use of theta to make your code position independence, and you write out your constants as pseudo orders. Um, now there's, there was an, a very useful um, advanced facility called code letters. Um, essentially, there were a set of letters in the um, EDSAC alphabet, um, which could be used in place of the F and the D that we saw for um, fixed and um, double length numbers. And associated with each letter was a location in store. And so if you put something in the corresponding store location, that is the value that would be added to the instruction. So F works because in location 41, initial orders has zero. And D works because in location 43, initial orders have one. And theta works because as initial orders are loading, in 42, it remembers the origin of the current routine. Um, and so theta is one of these code letters. But it turns out you can use others. And we'll see how to use that in, in a moment. The other things to talk about is how do you pass parameters to subroutines? The most common way of doing it is that the subroutine assumes its arguments are in a fixed address. And very often that's location zero. Um, or you can include the um, arguments in the calling sequence. Perhaps if I dodge back two slides. Um, if um, I followed the jump, maybe by some data, and the subroutine was expecting arguments at the end of the subroutine, rather than just adding two, I could add three or four so that I come back after the block of parameters. And that was quite a, a common technique used. So here's a, a slightly more complex program. Um, this is um, using, um, again, printing out um, reciprocals, but this, uh, that, sorry, the last one was, was, was cubes. Now I'm printing out reciprocals. Uh, it's really hard doing this when you're not working on the blackboard. Um, this is printing out, did I just show you the reciprocals running? I did, I should have shown you the cubes. I do beg your pardon. Let me come back to the emulator. Sorry, I should have shown you running the, the cubes program. You'll see the reciprocals in a minute. If I start the um, cubes program loading, it loads. And then um, it stops, it waits for me to issue a reset, and then it starts printing out cubes. Sorry about that. Now I must remember to come back to reciprocals for this one. Back to the, the slides. So um, now we're looking at a, a program that's going to print out a table of reciprocals. The, the most significant difference here is um, notice um, I've put an M as a symbol in the com in the, the comments by the constant the program needs. So at the head of the program, I'm doing my usual um, GK, but I'm following it by T47K, and that's saying set the location 47 that corresponds to M, and I'm setting 47 to 21 relative to theta, the current loading point. My program is 21 instructions long, so 21 relative to the start, is this block M. And then in my program, to reference the, um, the data, 
I use M as the suffix on the order. So subtract um, location, subtract from location one M and uh, one M. And if I look at one M, that's nine. So that will calculate minus nine. Um, and I store that in six M that stores it in this location, which is the count that starts off as a, a zero. That's the interpretation of PF. So by using these code letters, um, I can um, separate program from data. And that means if I change some of the orders in my, um, in my program, I've only got to think about the jump instructions um, because those will have moved. Whereas the data references will all be relative to this M block. Now, remember what I type in my program is just the instruction codes. All this annotation down the side and all these comments are just to help you understand what's going on in the program. So the way um, this program is put together, it starts with a T56 to start loading from 56. It loads a routine called M3. Um, M3 is an interesting routine. Um, it essentially prints out the text following it as a heading and then deletes itself. Um, so it's a way in which you can put a heading on your output without using up any of the memory of the machine that you want for your main program. Then we bring in the main program. Um, we put D6, which is a divide routine in at 56. We then put P1, which is a print routine. Um, that just follows on. Who knows what location P1 is in? And then we put in our master tape. Because our master tape goes in last and our master tape has um, defined the um, theta parameter, um, then EZPF says jump to theta. We come into our master tape. So you can work out where things are um, because you can look in the library specification and see that D6 is 36 orders long and P1 is 21 orders long, and therefore your master is 113. But you didn't need to know that while you were writing your program. So let's look at running that. So this is reciprocals, and you did see this running earlier. Um, here is the, the paper tape in that code. There's the M3 routine followed by the title. There's the D6 routine, which does division for you. There's our old friend P1 again, um, which is doing um, printing. And there's the master with the GK at the beginning, setting theta to point at our, our own code. And so if I clear the memory, if I clear the memory, if I clear the, the teleprinter and I start, that's the heading you saw that was printed out while the store was still loading. And those are the reciprocals being printed by the, the machine. And there are several routines like this M3. Um, there's one that's um, useful because it will read in numbers for you um, and put them in, in, um, in the memory. And so that is a way in which you can write numbers without having to convert them into, into pseudo orders. So let's come back to the PowerPoint. Um, now, what happens when things go wrong? Um, what you could obviously imagine doing with those cathode ray tubes is staring at the screen as it runs. And you may have noticed there was a single step order, but using that was frowned on because you would basically be hogging the machine. And so the, um, the library included um, some post-mortem routines that could look at um, the state of the store after your program finished. So I'm going to show you one of those post-mortem routine five, um, and um, that will print out a dump of the memory. I'm going to print out the data block in that program. We knew it starts, the master program starts at location 113. We know the program was 21 words long. So location 134 is where the data starts. If I come back to the emulator, um, if I now load PM5, three and four, and then you'll see um, it starts doing a post-mortem dump from that point. I'll stop it there. Um, 
And if your memory is good, you'll recall that um, the numbers um, in the, the, the constants and variables section of the example, in fact, we may even be able to see it. Um, reciprocals master, it's a bit hard to unpick, but it goes PD, P4D, QF. Notice um, that some things um, apparently misprint that's because the output hasn't got the Greek letters that you want on the, the input. Um, so sometimes you have to be a bit thoughtful in, in how you interpret this. But that will let you look at the, um, the numbers. And there are a batch of post-mortem routines that will print in different formats. Another facility to help you with um, this was you could also put um, debugging and tracing in. Um, and so um, there were two routines that were quite heavily used. One called C7, which you would load at the end of your program um, with a rather magic um, control sequence at the beginning. And C7 gives you an execution trace. And I'll demonstrate this in a moment. And you can see where I stole the idea for the execution trace in the command line emulator. And C10 gives you an arithmetical trace. And again, you can see where I stole the idea from. So if I come back to the emulator, um, if I load reciprocals and C7, so you'd include the tracing routine as part of your program. Your program's gone wrong. Um, you, you decide to run it again with tracing turned on. So let me clear, let me clear the console and load the reciprocals program with the tracing. And what you will see is the same tracing showing you the first letter of each order as it's executed. Of course, if your program is producing output, things get a bit scrambled. So you have to look at it quite carefully. Um, but there you're seeing a trace of um, the orders that are being executed by the machine. So I'll stop that one. I'll clear the screen clear the output and if I find reciprocals and C10 this is the arithmetic tracing and run our program and then as the program runs you'll see it's essentially outputting a number each time the accumulator changes and it feeds in a new line every time a jump is taken so you can roughly follow the logic of your program by seeing where the jumps are um, and um, see how the, the accumulator is changing numerically and see where your, your sums have gone wrong. So we're nearly there um, in terms of going through most of the facilities. If you want to use the command line emulator um, to run user programs, um, you can. Um, you, you um, essentially um, just um, give the name of the file that you, you want to run. I can show you that um, very quickly. If I go back to here, if I clear and I run demo five, I run demo five. The, the commands um, that there are essentially three commands. There's a command called punch that will take a text file um, of um, your, your program. There's a command called EDSAC, which is the emulator. And there's a command called tprint that will convert EDSAC output to teleprinter code. If I show you the demo, demo5.sh, you can see it literally is punch a source program. So it turns that source program into EDSAC code, pipes that into the emulator, um, which knows to um, um, essentially push the start button and run it. And any output is piped into tprint. So you get to see the output there. And if I show you the program, um, uh, demos, demo5.txt, you'll see it is actually the reciprocals program, the identical um, text that I ran through the, the other emulator. So programs are interchangeable between the two. So that's talked about that. Um, finish up. Um, just to um, give you a contrast, um, what other people were doing, 
This is a page from Alan Turing's guide to programming the Manchester Mark I. If you wanted to program the Manchester Mark I, you basically had to program in binary um, and you input the program by using the, um, the character codes that gave you the bit patterns you need for the binary that you'd written. So it was in no way mnemonic. Those E's and T's and whatever um, aren't meaningful as, as letters in the way that A and S are. And you've got to convert that notation in your head into binary and understand it as a number or understand it as an order. Um, and they call Alan Turing the father of modern computing. I'm not quite sure how they work that one out. So um, I've, I've finished, I need to finish, we're nearly out of time. Um, what I hope I've done is shown you that EDSAT programming is, is fun for pleasure and profit. If you want to get started, I would recommend downloading the Warwick Simulator, which comes with an excellent tutorial um, and lots of examples to work through. As you're playing with um, any of the, the emulators, simulators, the things to be aware of, Remember the store is tiny. Be careful about long versus short numbers. If you really are doing calculations, remember to scale them so things don't overflow. Remember there are no index registers. Um, so if you are using vectors, arrays, or stacks, um, it's often better to write yourself some subroutines that look after that for you. Read the library routine specifications carefully to understand the parameter passing conventions and also any special control combinations um, to load them. Make use of the code letters to keep your program in short blocks so you don't have to renumber things too often. Um, be careful if you're coding constants as pseudo orders. Um, it's much better to use the library routines. And certainly if you're writing long numbers, um, I really recommend using the, the library routines to do that. There are some subtle issues um, about um, what happens if you try and write a long, a long number by writing a short number to two adjacent locations. In general, it doesn't work. And remember the need to set the teleprinter shift when you're making outputs and you have to force out the last character. You want to pull some questions out that have come through? Well, actually, there's only one um, right. from André Orlan who says he's written a uh, simulator for Raspberry Pi. Mm -hmm. And are we interested? Sure. Um, and there, there are quite a few simulators out there in, in various languages. Um, it would be, um, yes, interesting to see the simulator. Um, I would urge anyone who's written the simulator to provide an option to read in the same notation that the um, Campbell Kelly simulator uses. And then we can um, you know, run programs against each of them and cross check the, the answers. Um, but yes, it'd be interesting to know about more. Can you uh, oh, elaborate on the 17 versus 35 not being equal to 17 times two? Yeah, it's actually very simple. Um, so in the hardware, the memory is actually divided into 18-bit words, but the first bit um, is effectively a spacer. Um, it allows EDSAC time um, when it's processing um, data to kind of set itself up to be ready to do a calculation on the remaining 17 bits. So if you have two adjacent short numbers, it's spacer 17 bits, spacer 17 bits. If you address that location as a long number, only the first spacer is, is working as a spacer and the, the second spacer, which would be the, the 18th bit in, is effectively available as data because the, everything else is up and running and synchronized. And so um, in the programmer world, you get a bit for free, um, but in the um, hardware world, um, you have to understand it's, it's an 18-bit machine. And that causes no end of confused conversations between EDSAC programmers and EDSAC engineers, because one group think it's all 18 bits, um, and they number the bits differently, and you can get in a wonderful muddle. Um, and there, there are some clever dodges. If you really understand the hardware, you can actually set a long number 
using short number rights, but um, I don't recommend it. Use, use the library routines for reading them in. Okay, and the next one is, do you have any brief uh, comments on how the EDSAC influenced subsequent programming and languages for programming? So um, a lot of the ideas were actually picked up by IBM, a machine called the 605. Um, most of the rest of the world ignored the EDSAC ideas and programmed in binary. And we get quite a way into the late 1950s before we start seeing assemblers and autocodes and so forth um, that you know, come close to giving you the same level of, um, of abstraction. And if you talk to any of the surviving EDSAC programmers, and there are a few, you know, they really didn't have to know very much about the details of the machine or the binary representation. Um, and that just made it you know, very easy for them to learn how to program and to write programs. Um, and so it was you know, anticipating modern ideas about high level languages and you don't really have to understand the machine. You express yourself in a notation that's convenient for the job you're trying to do. And that appears at this time to be the last question, which is, means we're going to finish pretty much on schedule. Phew. And uh, we're going to announce the next two talks. On Wednesday, February 9th, we have um, the Open University, 20 years of comp teaching computing and microelectronics at the Open University, which of course is just down the road from us at the National Museum of Computing in Bletchley. And then we welcome once again, Andrew back again, to talk about programming the Elliot 903. And we also have restarted our program of guided public tours on selected Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays. And please see tnmoc.org slash events to book yourself onto one. So with that, I will close the call. Thank you everybody for attending and good night. Good night. <laughs>